You're listening to Sense and Sustainability. This is the podcast series for everything to do with sustainable supply chains. Okay, so welcome to our regular podcast series, Sense and Sustainability. What we like to try and do for our listeners is to bring them inspirational stories from from around the world. So Dale, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little about what you're doing these days and and how you got to where you've got to? Yes, it's four. I am an ex-Royal Navy Marine Engineer and then I left the Navy and went into contracting in the oil and gas, petrochem, gas turbine, heavy industry sector. I was there for 20 years and then decided to leave and start my own renewable business. What that looked like, I didn't know at the time. I just knew I wanted to start it. So three and a half years ago, myself and another friend of mine set up Dealer Contractors, which is now Vero Engineering, and we went into the geothermal sector, agricultural sector, and we design and manufacture geothermal pumping stations in the shipping containers allowing people to not use buildings and sort of circumvent the planning permission. So to date, we have done over 50 megawatts of geothermal energy, that being grain drying, dairy chilling, uh, potato storage, mainly in the agricultural sector. And we have just joined forces with three other companies to bring together Vero Group. That consists of an industrial electrical division, a solar and battery storage design, manufacture and commissioning sector, a renewable sector, so we manufacture our, all, our own equipment as well, and we have an import-export business, which is based predominantly the import and export of solar systems, solar equipment, renewable equipment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're based in the port of Sunderland, which is a lovely place, called but lovely. We have a manufacturing facility here and all our businesses are based out of here. At present, we have about 25 staff all on the books, everybody's PYE, and we do subcontract as well when we have large projects. We are predominantly national and we do some international business as well. We currently run two solar off-grid systems in Zambia at the moment, which we designed and built ourselves, which power a clinic, shops, a school, things like that. So it's really looking at that whole renewable sector and trying to see where we can bring value to that sector and sort of educating people on what a renewable package is. It's challenging. There's a lot of skeptics out there. However, there was a lot of people starting to grasp what it's actually all about and how it can benefit themselves, their businesses, what social value it gives and really just understanding what products are out there and trying to bring the best products to market in a package. That's that's basically it, really. So, yeah, thanks very much for, for that introduction, Dale. So what made you decide? I mean, you, you know, you, you, you have the, this background in the military and then in the oil and gas sector. What made you suddenly decide to pack it all in and, and start a renewables business? Well, I was the... Um... Aftermarket director for Europe and Africa for a multinational, which took a lot of my time. And basically, I was doing 60 flights a year around Europe, Middle East, Africa. And I just got a bit burnt out and a bit tired and decided, well, I was partly in the renewable sector anyway, in the offshore wind on the heavy engineering side. And I knew about the um, renewable sector. I've done a lot of research on it over a, a year and a half with the business and decided that this was the way forward and this was the way the next opening up of a, I suppose, manufacturing sector and a, a bold on to the oil and gas sector, petrochem, they're all going to embrace renewables at some point. What that point was, I didn't know. I really just decided, well, since I was 16, I've been traveling. I was 45 at the time, 46 and just went, right, that's enough. I need to do something local and try and give back to the region what I've had from the region, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, it certainly chimes with me. I also have a background in oil and gas. I used to work for Shell in procurement. So I had, I had 10 years with oil and gas and 11 years in aviation. And I think I was 49 when I packed it in and, and started my own business and, and went my own way. So um, yeah, I have a lot of, a lot of sympathy and, and empathy with what you're saying. If we look at the renewable sector in the UK, I mean, I've I used to advise FMC Technologies, who you, you may be aware of for, for many years, and used to say to them, well, you know, you're an oil and gas business, but surely marine renewables are the, the next level for you. And it, it seems to me that big corporates are a little bit slow to turn around and to understand what you've just said. I mean, that the future is very much in renewables. How do you see, I suppose, your competition and, and your peers? And, you know, what, what are other businesses in your space doing? A very good question. The first, I'll take that in chunks. The first one is the, uh, the multinationals, the big businesses. Because the behemoths, I think it takes a lot for them internally to change tack, and it's got to come from the top down. And we all know when we've done our business modules at uni and things like that, there's a lot of blockers there, and there's a lot of people who are comfortable in what they do and know it works, and that's the way that model works. There's a lot of people understand renewables in that sector, but either can't be bothered, haven't got time, or don't need to because it's not their problem. I think the CEOs of the big multinationals understand it, and it's a case of, well, how do we start moving into that sector? What do we do? What's going to be our USP? How can we take our existing product and add value to it from a renewable point of view? Secondly, if we break the renewables up into sectors in the UK, heavy industry, medium industry, SME and residential, that's the four sectors. And in that sector comes everything else. The big ones, the heavy industry, your car manufacturers, your, your shells, your oil, your oil and gases of the world, they're happy with their product, what they've got. And we know margins are tight for the car manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems to be the car manufacturers are leading the way. The oil and gas and the petrochem, they have the facilities and the resources to do it. It's just putting that into practice. They seem to create lots of teams to do lots of renewable things, but don't do a lot, if that makes sense. Then you have the, the medium-sized business. You're up to 50 million, say, if we, if we go by the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce. They want to do it, but don't know where to start. I think money is a restraint. Obviously, the economy at the moment. And then SMEs, really like myself, really have an understanding because... They're in that sector, and the, me as MD and CEO of the group, we can turn on a sixpence, if you know what I mean. We can actually look at that and focus and change our business, not on a daily basis, but a weekly, monthly. We can, we can sort, we've got a lot more sway in which way we direct ourselves, if you know what I mean. It's quite easy for us to turn, if you know what you're doing. And then you have the residential market, which is huge, but highly problematic because there is a lot of people doing the same thing. And what I mean by that is on the solar side, a lot of people just putting solar on the roof with no batteries, no understanding of whether you need a um, grid forming or a grid following system, et cetera, et cetera. We don't do residential as a rule because we find you have Davy the roofer and Peter the electrician who are working as a pair and putting solar on the roof. And we can't really compete at that level of pricing. It's good for the client. However, it's bad for the client because we, you cannot regulate the system on what quality of work they're getting or what quality of panels. So we took that conscious decision and not to go down that road and try and design bespoke systems and educate the client first on what they actually need versus what they want, thus reducing their cost, but maximizing their renewable equipment and return on equipment does that does that sound up yeah that sounds about right what i'm trying to do yeah it makes a lot of sense so what you're saying is your first step is a kind of an advisory service if you like to under, really understand your client and and then to be able to recommend the sort of technical solutions that they need yeah exactly so we get lots of people coming to us saying i want to put solar on my factory yeah fine what's your usage well i don't really know 
what do you actually want? Well, I want to power everything by solar. That's not possible in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. Right, okay, then. What you're actually doing to reduce your energy cost, the easiest one is replace all your strip lighting with LEDs. Fine, put them on timers. That's an easy win. And normally their maintenance electricians could do that or they get a contractor in to do it on a shutdown. That's fine. And then what we do is we look at voltage optimization and power factor correction. So the incoming supply, we, we look at that really and how that's been delivered to the client. Then we optimize that power. Then we say, right, this is what your solar is. You're maximizing your solar yield by lowering your incoming and making all the sustainable changes before you even put the solar on. Looking at the latest technology, what's coming out, i.e. the size of the panels, what the inverters are doing. Do we need a couple of battery system up? How do we manage that battery system? What's best for the client? Because solar and batteries, everybody thinks they're the same, they're not. You can get smart batteries, you can get lithium iron, you can get lithium phosphate, you know, and all that coupled together brings the package for the client. And it, it, it's a long process, but if the client is serious about it, then he'll follow us on, on and we'll help them with that journey. If they're not, then they just say, oh, no, it's all right. And they'll go to somebody else, David and Peter, that puts all on the roof for them. Yeah, so it's, it's reducing the demand first, which is, you know, it, it, you kind of think it was an obvious step, wasn't it? But uh, I can imagine you get a lot of clients saying, yeah, plaster me roof with solar panels, and, and that's the answer. They are just taking the conversation in, in another direction. How are you seeing supply of components? I mean, you, you've mentioned solar panels, and one of the things that my business is looking at is some of the human rights issues related to manufacture of solar panels in China. And I think some quite compelling evidence around the, you know, the, the solar panels are not far from the Uyghur camps. And there's certainly some potentially good evidence that the Uyghur slaves effectively are being used to, to manufacture solar panels. There's also another client of mine supplies glass to a company called First Solar in the United States. And they're incredibly successful, but the, the, their order book is like two and a half years. If you want solar panels from them, you order solar panels now. If you're lucky, you'll get them into and a half years time where are you on on supply and demand and also maybe some of the ethical controversies that we see in the supply chain Enforcement on the, on the ethical side of it at the moment we purchase from uk suppliers only so we look at their ethical supply chain to a point what they'll let you see that's another thing which people are slow to take up on the actual ethical side of it we currently i can't say we don't like to buy from china there's a few aspects in there what make it not very good at the moment, i.e. the shipping, they're in full COVID lockdown. So we, 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 buy, we buy from UK stockholders, and that's how we protect our supply chain that way. And the second one, looking at how we, we procure and, and what we do is we look at it and say, right, okay, this is what we want, and we go to our three suppliers. We always try and have three suppliers. One gets four, uh, 60, the other one gets 20, 20, and we try and keep it going around that way. We have seen a supply and demand issue, especially with the troubles in the Ukraine, and I think that's, that's a global problem as it is. We see one day there is 2,000 panels in our stockists, the next year there is 100 left. We see a lot of bulk buying from a lot of big companies who then try and bump the price up because they know the demand. And even if that's £10 a panel more, they have just bought, bought them off our supplier and then away we go. We are looking at alternatives, i.e. we're looking at supplies out of Turkey. We have engaged with some Turkish suppliers and we are in the process of looking at what their ethical programme is. They do, we know they do a lot of business in Europe and in the UK, so we know... The supply chain seems to be okay, but you can never really be sure until you get out there and get your feet on the ground. As I've spent lots of time in Africa, Middle East, you have to go and look and make your own decisions because looking on a, a PowerPoint just doesn't do anything any justice. And I guess on, on the other side of the equation in terms of demand for your products and services, uh, I, I would imagine that you're very much in demand at the moment. Is that the case? Yes, we're very much in demand. 
we have a sales pipeline of about eight and a half million at the moment. If everything comes in, we're pretty, we're pretty damn be under the cost, so to speak, from manufacturing. And that covers a variety of sectors. So that covers our own product. We've designed and manufactured over COVID a yeah, diesel displacement generator because we knew the, the, the red diesel tariff was getting abolished. And that basically uses solar coupled with batteries to lower your diesel runtime. If you do it cleverly, you can bring the generator in and run it at maximum level, optimizing the time you're doing, charging the batteries, and then it drops straight out. We have our solar lighting products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a mix of our own products based on what the client wants, and we try and marry them all in together. Demand is very high, but again, I go back to people don't know what they want. Half of my time is spent just on the phone trying to try and tease out of them what they want, that what, what you want to know to put the system together. We do a lot of data logging. So we actually log the client's income and power so that it does us frequency, it does us voltage, it does us our maximum and peaks and troughs over a week's period. But that takes time. You've got to get there, put it on, take it off, analyze the data, create a report, and then sit with the client not all the time to explain the reports. Sometimes you have to explain it. Yeah. We all, we had one guy three weeks ago told us he was data logging the factory. And this is a big factory, by the way, a multinational company. So we asked him how he was doing it. And he was just plugging a voltmeter into the socket. <laughs> right. It's not really data logging, is it? <laughs> it's really data logging at all, is it? So right up here then. So we, we went and persuaded him to put a full data logging analysis on. A lot of people want to expand the business but grid constraint is a big thing as well i don't think people realize that you cannot just put solar on and pump it back into the grid it doesn't work like that if one you've got to have permission two you've got to have capacity for the grid to take the electricity what you're generating and three the current tariffs don't make it that feasible really you know so there's a lot of misconception on Oh yeah, I'll put solar on, I'll generate that in the grid and I'll make money. No, not really. You know, we try and get them to use batteries and store as much energy as possible and then go down that route. So how do you see the future of renewables? Uh, you know, we, we've touched on a number of things here and, uh, and and particularly grid capacity, which obviously is uh, is a major issue. I mean, you know, the, the grid is going to have to change if we're going to move towards more localised generation. Where, where do you think we'll be in, in, you know, in power supply in, say, five years' time? Uh, I think we'll be even more under the cush because what I think yeah. the, the maritime industry have two directives coming out. One is for more battery coasters, ships or local ships or European coasters. They are trying to get them to change from diesel, heavy diesel to batteries. Now, if we go at the UK ports and we just have a business as usual scenario, by 2050, we will need 250 gigawatts just to keep up with current supply. If we go down the battery route for ships, we will need 4,000 gigawatts. Now, what's driving that is the second legislation what comes out in 2024, 25, I think, where when a ship docks alongside, it is not allowed, it's, it's not allowed to be under its own generation. It has to go to shore power, which is reducing emissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that is going to create a, a big problem. Put more demand on the grid, which is not there. It puts more demand on the grid, yeah. The answer to your question is we're going to have to have a lot more localised generation and split the grid up into smaller chunks rather than have one big distribution network, I think it's going to have to be smaller. If if that makes sense, i.e. Yeah. Rolls-Royce bringing out the nuclear stuff. Oh, these small nuclear sets, yeah, absolutely. Small nuclear sets and things like that. I think that's the only way. And then you've got EV chargings coming online yeah. as well. You know, I just don't... I don't see it. That's why I think renewables is a big part. If you can get a lot of residentials and SMEs generating, say, 50% of their usage, that will free the grid up yeah. to go into industry because the everybody's saying the economy needs to grow. It can only grow if we have the capacity to do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've um, one of my clients is a very large company in the extractive industry, and they're talking about uh, you know how how they make cement in the future in a carbon free way, and how they how they fuel these big tonker toys that go around quarries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, it all comes back to grid capacity, and and even um, uh, contractors in the construction sector, clients in the construction sector, are saying that you know we we build stuff around the country, but we can't get grid services to temporary construction sites fast enough to be able to charge up the electric gizmos that we'd like to use because the technology at the end i mean the, the you know the, the electric diggers and you know lighting towers and generators and all of those sorts of things are all there the technology exists but if you can't plug them in um, they're not much use to you I, I totally agree with that and i think i think as well what's really interesting is is how we are looking at that. I don't think we're looking at, looking at it in a pragmatic way. I think we're just looking at, oh, well, I've got a, yeah, we've designed some battery-driven lorries. Okay, then. But they're two 300-kilowatt batteries, and you're going to need huge rapid charges for them to be sort of anywhere near 10 hours charge or 5 hours charge for them to be profitable to keep going, you know? Absolutely. And, and and then where do you find the capacity? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a bleak picture, but I totally understand. I mean, you know, I, I think your story is really inspirational. It's just great to hear about people like you that, you know, make a, a big, bold decision to get out of corporate life, make a totally different change and, and then, you know, make a difference to society in the way that you have. But the challenges going forward are, are going to be absolutely huge. Dale, I'm sure we could talk about this for all day, I'm sure, but I guess we, we ought to wrap up. I mean, you know, thanks very much. I hope our listeners enjoy your inspirational story and, and where you've come from and, and also your perspective perspective as a small business on the renewables energy, you know, specifically in the UK, but the renewables industry is, is not that different in other parts of the world. So it's absolutely brilliant to hear you. And uh, thank you very much, Dale, and I wish you success in your business. Just share one more thing. Mm. Any of you who are thinking about it, yeah. think through the card, do a plan. You don't have to stick to it. And remember, it is difficult, but keep going. Yeah, and if you need any help, just contact us, and I'll I'll do whatever I can. And if I can help you in any way, you know, or you want us to speak, or do anything, I do a lot of speaking for um, Northeast Lab, the uni, things like that. I can help. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Dale. That that was that was great. Thank you for listening to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast for sustainable supply chains. Do visit our website, iso2400.org, for more information.